वन ऑफ आर सीनियर फेलोज डॉक्टर नंदिनी भट्टाचार्य पांडा हु इज अ डिस्टिंग्विश्ड स्कॉलर ऑन हिंदू लॉ हैज रिटन लॉट ऑफ इंपॉर्टेंट आर्टिकल्स एंड आई सो फर एज आई नो वन सेमिनल बुक ऑल्सो ऑन द सब्जेक्ट टूडे शी इज स्पीकिंग ऑन द एथनो सोशियोलॉजी ऑफ लॉ इन नॉर्थ ईस्ट इंडिया अली लीगल फॉर्मेशन एज रिफ्लेक्टेड इन द कॉलोनियल आर्काइव of course she is our senior fellow i still i welcome her and uh, we have with us uh, professor m amarjeet singh to uh, chair this talk he is a professor at the center for north east studies and policy research jamia millia islamia new delhi where he teaches courses on social conflict and sociology and politics of india's north east he has previously worked with institute for defense studies and analyses new delhi and national institute of advanced studies in the institute of science campus bengaluru his research interests focus on conflict studies identity politics and immigration and migration studies he has written on these topics in widely circulated journals such as journal of asian public policy small wars and insurgencies commonwealth and comparative politics economic and political weekly he has edited several books including identity contestation and development in northeast india um northeast india and india's act east policy identifying the priorities he has also conducted studies sponsored by different agencies such as the indian council of social science research new delhi so i warmly welcome welcome professor m amarjeet singh also and now i hand over to him to conduct the proceedings further thank you very much sir and i am also thankful to the nehru memorial museum and library for uh, inviting me uh, on this occasion so this is a very very important occasion so uh, before we start uh, i will just briefly introduce today's speaker so many of you are i believe you are familiar with uh, uh, dr nandini batasarji panda she is a uh, Uh, currently working as a senior fellow at the nehru memorial museum and library working on history lineage and dynamics of laws in northeast india she has masters of arts in modern history from university of kolkata dphil from university of oxford and uh, dr panda uh, nandini was a guest faculty at women studies center university of Kolkata and uh, she was also associated for a long time with the uh, Indian Institute of Advanced Studies Simla and also with the Maulana Abul Kalam Azad Institute of Asian Studies where she worked on different issues uh, uh, Dr Panda command a good knowledge over Sanskrit especially Smriti Nyaya and Minamsa uh, traditions and uh, she has a widely lecture on hindu laws northeast india other subjects in leading national and international universities such as university of cambridge and the the university of uh, pennsylvania dhaka university national university of judicial sciences kolkata among other institutions and dr panda has been working on the eastern himalayas including nepal north east india for a long time she has also been working on the cultural history of the hill communities in north east india she has published one important book on the cultural traditions of two ethnic communities she has also made a documentary film in 2016 on the lepsa communities of eastern himalaya under the title a uh, lepsa community of darjeeling and kalimpong hing so i am not going to take much time so uh, dr panda will be speaking on the uh, ethno sociology of law in north east india early legal formation as reflected in the colonial archive i think the topic is very very interesting and we look forward to listen to her so may i now request uh, dr nandini panda to start so you can take about uh, 45 minutes okay. yes madam please go ahead thank you very much professor singh 
Uh, I am really honored to be a part of your book, which has recently published from Routledge, uh, North East India and India, India's Activist Policy, identifying the priorities. I am privileged to be you know, in your team, and I am honored that you are chairing my lecture. I am grateful to uh, the Deputy Director, Dr. A.V. Mishra, for introducing me. And this is my second and final lecture as Senior Fellow of NMML. I have offered, I have received uh, extreme, ex uh, I have received so much help from everyone from this institution, from the director, Still, all the, all the research team, like uh, Dr. Narendra Shukla, Rajnish Ranjan, Iqbal Ahmed, and there are so many, I really cannot name. The title of my presentation is The Ethnosociology of Law in Northeast India, Early Legal Formation as Reflected in the Colonial Archive. The paper, however, sums up the significance and partly the outcome of my study. This study is essentially based on decoding colonial archive so far as, so far as I could not access uh, to the vernacular archive, especially the indigenous land records and folkloric tradition of the tribes. The fellowship is for two years and I had to take a long time to work in the Assam State Archive and other archives in Meghalaya. The story is long and complex. Therefore, it may appear like a glossed over narrative due to time limit. As for the title, while finishing the study, I have traced ethnosociology, not any legal theory, had been the motivating forces behind the colonial legal formation in Northeast Frontier. I have used the term ethnosociology to signify the essence, ideology, and spirit of law, law within court in the Northeast Frontier. Law is essentially a product of civilization, culture, geography, economy, and most importantly, the imperatives of a given state. State within court, as it is essentially a modern concept. The history book writings on pre-colonial India refer to the regimes as empire, kingdom, and dynasty, rather than state, such as Mauryan Empire, Gupta Empire, Chola Dynasty, Ahom Kingdom in Kamrup and Assam, Mughal Empire, Namgil Dynasty in Sikkim, and there are myriad examples. The notion of state formally came into use in the context of colonial state, although the colonial state often referred to, to it as the British Empire. It is not the place to discuss why and how the British symbolically imbibed the tradition of empire within the definitional narrative. Bernard Cohn analyzed the motivations and modus operandi of the symbolic use of empire by the British in his article Representing Authority in Victorian India in the book Invention of Tradition, edited by Eric Hogswam and Terence Ranger. The British arrived in India from European Enlightenment traditions of nation states. The British system, though, was an usual and complex example of a nation state with limited monarchy. Army, executive and judiciary constituted the most important apparatus of a modern state. And finally, how law within court is being defined by, by a modern state. I borrow JDM Derrick's definition cited below. Law is the body of rules namely positive and negative injunctions, commands and prohibitions. 
which can be enforced by judicial actions, a rule which will not be observed directly or indirectly in a court or before a tribunal is not law. What ought, in some people's opinion, to be law is not law. Ethical injunctions are not law. That which is left to choice is not law. The British rulers arrived in India with the baggage of this legal philosophy alongside the agenda to conquer and rule the country. Law evolved in colonial India through complex civilization and encounter. Given the pluralistic, ethnically and culturally heterogeneous character of the territory which they call as India, the colonial rulers tried to formul formulate pragmatic structures for different social groups to implement legal administration in different regions. The legal governance of British Empire produced broadly three sets of law, a Hindu law, b Mohammedan law, and finally tribal customary law, customary law within court, and became integral components of the colonial governance in India. The presentation of The presentation on ethnosociology of legal formation in Northeast India is situation, situated in this larger context. Before the advent of the British, there had been no geographical or geopolitical category called Northeast India. In the colonial discourses, the entire region loosely emerged as the Northeast frontier of the British territory frontier or the periphery of imperial mainland. The British became the ruler of the territory following the Anglo-Burmese war. The Burmese, Burmese army ceded to the East India Company in 1826 by the Treaty of Yandabu. David Scott, the commissioner of Northeast Rangpur, <coughs> became the commissioner of Assam and it became the administrative headquarter of the colonial administration in the Northeast. As the ruler, the British introduced two sets of law in Northeast frontier. A. Regulations, acts or constitutional law in the plains, valleys or lower Assam. B. Customary law within court in the hill frontiers. As for category B, the implementation of inner line regulation of 1873 and creation of excluded within court and partially excluded within court areas were apparent to meant to protect tradition and customary law of tribal subjects. The quarantine, however, did not and could not prevent the abrogation of the customary rights of the hill communities and privatization of communal holdings which will be discussed in section 2 of this paper. The background of the legal formation. The early imperial agenda in the Northeast encountered different categories of subjects to be broadly divided into two categories. Other than the decadent and dwindled Ohom kings, there were very large uh, landowners or rajas in every part of the plains, valleys and hills also, having numerous and varied categories of grant holders or subjects under their jurisdiction. Other than those, there were, quote, fierce and unconquered tribes, unquote, inhabiting in the hills and forests as defined by R. Boilu Pemberton in 1835 in his book Report of the Eastern Frontier of British India. Indeed, a Northeastern frontier posed drivers and critical challenges to the British sovereigns on account of disparity in geography, economy, polity, society, culture, and most importantly, the ethnic composition. Hinduism was the dominant faith of the people in mainland Assam 
well there had been numerous tribal communities in that region as well the elite and non tribal population in manipur followed vaishnavism which had been counted as hinduism by the british rest of the population uh, rest of northeast was primarily inhabited by the tribal population professing their own tradition they enjoyed over the land and forest and also their drive diverse traditional or customary rites or practices the colonial projects such as pan plantation the tea, tea or tea especially or rubber, rubber plantation mining expropriation of natural resource, resources like oil timber and other forest products was practically impossible within without bringing those communities under absolute control the colonial legal formation in the northeast frontier was set in this background the rulers had been driven by three major imperatives a control over resources land revenue water mineral and others b the legitimate subordination of the native subjects c the establishment of civilizational supremacy over subject the colonial law, law when i use the term law and frontier always with i in court within court the colonial law was thus devised and structured as an edifice that assumed for itself the mantle of moral rule and social justice on the surface but in actual practice to be appropriated as an instrument to ensure hegemony over land and resources significantly none of the law givers in northeast frontier hailed from that legal background bradley bird the distinguished colonial administrator of late 19th and early 20th century an illustrious author of the history of the book of history of an indian upland uh, published in 1905 described the officials who framed tribal law as many sided men many sided men within court they performed the duties of soldier collector of revenue <laughs> judge who delivered i court fair and impartial administration of justice and court and i court to inspire people who had hitherto known no restraint save as their own crude tribal customs and primitive institutions had taught them with a respect for the first principles of law and justice and code they commanded remarkable capability as bradley burk boasted quote to evolve order out of chaos in the territories inhabited by the savage and barbaric with that co within court tribes such were the people who were behind the legal formation in the northeast frontier extant custom vis-a-vis -vis colonial in imperatives in lower assam introduction of formal legal structure while structuring the legal governments in Nor in governance in northeast colonial rulers refused their ideologies and imperatives in a subtle but obvious manner both in the plains valleys and the hills as well the study on the whole analyzes the complete complex and violent process through which the colonial masters imposed the sovereign law amounting to gross violation of the existing custom and customary rights the catchword was i quote areas of revenue and quote which they calculated ever since their con conquest and arrival in the land the areas of revenue led to transfer and sale of each category of land rent paying and rent free the colonial archive unravel the volatile and violent pace to activate and implement alienation within court that word and sale of the lands on the hereditary landowners ranging from the big zamindars such as rajang of darang to the holders of gote and paik lands brahmottar and devottar lands lakhiraj and nishkar raj lands 
leading to gross violation of existing custom. The attachment of the quality of alienation formally introduced the basic concept of private property to the extant landholding structure. Right to alienation is the elemental, elemental condition of private property rights, as you all know, evolved in 17th or 18th century England, Europe by the political philosophers such as John Locke, then joined by Thomas Hobbes, David Hume et al. Locke's theory is rooted in his concept of law of nature that permit individual to appropriate exercise rights over things in the world, such as land and other immovable material resources. resources. In other words, Locke propounded the theory of private property of which alienation is the essential quality. Such notions such a, of alienation were not part of the discur discursive genre on ownership of land in Indian soil. The formation of British colonial state brought new ideologies and paradigms leading to tr structural transformation fundamentally deviating from the extant socio-economic legal structure which the West previously defined that West defined that as Orientalism, Asiatic, Asiatic mode, etc. The colonial state in bold deployed military force along with culturalize, culturization by default civilizing, civilizing mission and reformation and legal instruments to draw the native subjects under control and, under control and hegemony. In the northeast frontier, similar policies had been pursued to draw varied categories of population under control. Insofar as legal instrumentality and culturization is concerned to acquire over control over land and people, in almost all the cases, the big and small landowners leveled as defaulters to clear areas of revenue within court. Had been, they had been taken to the colonial court. The sale proceed had started through decrease of the court, within court. The doctrine of caveat emptor had been introduced on the purchaser. Caveat emptor is a purely British legal term, which means the principle that the buyer alone is responsible for checking the quality and suitability of goods before a purchase is made. The application of such terms created the passage from custom to law, ownership to property, violating the existing practices relating to transaction of land. As evident in the archive, the British officials adopted the strategy of leveling pre-colonial regime as incompetent, worthless, and tyrant. For example, a letter was sent to the Czech secretary stating that the Darang Raja, I quote, befell the whole district, unquote, into, again quote, extortion and misrule, unquote. For example, Captain Bugle wrote, I quote, the imbecility and factions of the princes and nobles and the divided, debased and defenseless state of the people in general made it imperatively in incumbent upon us to retain military occupancy of the country for the peace and security of our frontier districts connected with it. Unquote. In the above statement, one may observe the ethnosociology as well as ethnopolitics of colonial law. The colonial archive labeled Purandar Singh and his son, son Kamishar as worthless and in incompetent after receiving complaints from the riot of their oppression and extortion. Kamishar explained to the British that according to the existing custom, the landowners did not levy any tax on the riots. They used to pay in the form of service. The Raja only 
collected ta- taxes from from the huts or market from the vendors the arrears of revenue forced them to impose tax on the riots and therefore they are complaining commissioners appeal had no significance to the british as they interested only on, only those people who could pay maximum re- amount of revenue to the treasury not a person of integrity adhering to the existing custom and the british labeled such people as worthless and incompetent same attitude had been shown to the holders of rent free lands such as lakhiraj nishkar raj brahmottar devottar etc i can't really discuss in detail Se- section 2 the tribes and the edifice of customary law customary law is an established category in the post colonial legal terminology especially in relation to the tribes this is also an inherited term from the le- colonial legal governments the colonial administrator generically referred to the custom of the native subjects as customary law in this context i would like to question do custom and customary law connote same definition law is a purely western concept evolved through cultural civilizational trajectory over centuries in europe the societal formation was different in asia or india law thus did not evolve with all its qualities ad uh, as understood and professed by the british and europeans hence one may ask did the indigenous communities in the northeast frontier had customary law before the british came those were structured refined and ready for use by an imperial power such as the such as the british who cherish the ultimate ulterior agenda of grabbing land and expropriating resources custom is flexible and the term connotes usual generally accepted and long established way of behaving or doing things or distinctive practices and convention of of a group of people in a given locality law is structured formally instituted to be the integral apparatus apparatus of a state the british repeatedly proclaimed that they retained the traditional customary law for the indigenous communities to assert moral rule in the newly acquired territory the colonial archive makes it evident that the british sovereign interpreted and transformed custom and uh, as customary law to become a new edifice an integral part of the colonial governance subsequently they coalesced them within the contested hierarchy of colonial regulations or code and customary law the ambivalent domain or the contested hierarchy between constitutional and customary law remains till date <coughs> to elaborate it further the colonial rulers seemingly followed a policy of minimum interference into the traditions and customs of the aboriginal subjects aboriginal within court not with the withstanding policy formulations the colonial archive contains voluminous reports on violence and massacre of hill subjects over the control of land and forest the tradition traditional habitat of the so called aboriginal subjects leading to desertion of their lands and mass displacement the archive provides vivid description of the so called protection of custom and making of customary law through massacre genocide eviction from ancestral lands legal prohibition of free use of forest produce which they do did from time immemorial conversion into christianity 
<coughs> sorry, and many other ingenious methods. It's not possible to narrate the process in a single lecture. I would therefore briefly discuss the ethnosociology of creating Khasi law, law within court in Meghalaya. It is also a long and complex story, trying to make it brief but meaningful narrative. As evident from the colonial accounts, the Khasi community attracted keen attention of the early British officials, A, for their savage and fierce, within quote of course, nature, B, the matrilineal system of inheritance. The matrilineal, matrilineal system was in fact a formidable source of their curiosity and concern because the colonial rulers on the whole <clears throat> and everywhere resented female inheritors or proprietors throughout India. To cut a long story, long story short, I would briefly narrate the passage from Khasi Ethnology to Khasi Code of Law. P.R.T. Gordon, Deputy Commissioner of Eastern Bengal and Assam, wrote a book titled The Khasis, first published in 1863. The author introduced the book as, I quote, an attempt to give a systematic account of the Khasi people, their manners and customs, their ethnological affinities, their laws and institutions, their religious beliefs, their folklore, theories as to, our, as to their origin and their language." Unquote. Garden's ethnographic account graphically reflected upon the habitat, appearance, physical and general characteristics, geographic, geographical distribution, distribution, origin, affinities, trace, tattooing, jewelry, weapons, occupation, agricultural, houses, villages, furniture, housing, household utensils, musical instruments, crops, hunting, fishing, food, drink, games, manufactures, pottery, and most importantly, law and customs, which he titled in bold. Garden wrote a, law, law, wrote a long narrative on the origin of matriarchal, the British always use the term a matriarchy instead of matrilany, matrilany, although the difference between matriarchy and matrilany is fundamental. Matri matriarchal structure in the Khasi hills on the basis of folklore. He based on the narrative on the folklore of Digendo clan. The section on state organization within court and the constitution of the Khasi state again within court seems to be quite problematic. <coughs> Use of the word constitution is extremely significant because it preceded the compilation of a text resembling a code on Khasi law after a few decades by Keith Cantley. In this section, Garden focused his attention on three aspects. A. Location of power and authority. B. Sources and pattern of land revenue and other kind of taxes. And C. Pattern of inheritance in a matriarchal, read matrilineal, social, familial structure. Garden found that Khasi state is a limited monarchy, within quote. Under the CM as head, use of the concepts such as constitution, limited monarchy, state organization, gradually started a new epoch in the region. Such were words were directly derived from the British or European structure of statecraft deploying such, such concepts to define completely societal and customary structures of an indigenous community initiated the process of colonizing the indigenous institutions. It was not merely a definitional transformation. Colonization of indigenous institutions either meant their functional liminality or 
complete substitution by the colonial structures. Now, and finally, I will briefly analyze Kit Cantley's book, Notes on Khasi Law. Kit Cantley produced his book on the wake of the 20th century. It was designed as a code on Khasi law. The etymological shift from custom to law indicate the changes already occurred in the process of legal formation in the Northeast. Cantley did not even use the word customary law, which had gained popular usage to define the customary practices of the tribal community. The early colonial administrators frequently used the term and the term remain, remains unaltered under the post-colonial regime. <clears throat> Cantley's book thus converted natural law posited in unwritten custom into positive law or doctrine and law codified in the text. Cantley's book had a few dominant features. In the first place, it did not elab elaborate on the nature of rights of Kakuddu, on the female heir to the family property. On the contrary, he was more concerned to write on the limits and restrictions on her rights. Secondly, the book elaborately deals with male heirs and extensions of their rights in the property. Thirdly, Cantley distinguishes rights of the Christian classes from the non-Christian counterparts. Other than that, he formulated Khasi law with frequent references to the verdicts of the court. As far as the guidance of the court, he wrote, I quote, it is necessary to emphasize the fact that these matters are decided by counsel of the family which does what appears to be just and proper in each case. So the settlement in one case is not fixed guidance for other cases. There are few decisions by courts as efforts by the courts to induce a settlement in the family have always been made. General rules for the guidance of courts are required, but unless it, it, uh, it be remembered that a court is administering the custom in place of the family council and managers, law created by decided may assume a rigidity not existent in custom and unsuitable to the needs of the people. In the above pass passage, one may trace the legal theorization or practical theorization of customary law within court. Customary law is apparently, as I already discussed, a contradictory concept, more so in the context of the tribal communities. The passage above is an important indication about how the British trying to try to bind both custom and law by definition and through legal procedure thereby produced customary law in their northeast frontier sorry one and a half pages not more than that yes, yes. <laughs> Cantley was gravely concerned about the right of Kakuddu and other female co-personers to sell, gift and transfer of their shares. Cantley's concern for right to sell is evident in the following passage. I quote, <coughs> Division of property is more frequent than continuance, continuance in a joint possession. A large area may be held by a clan but it is divided into separate portions held by the families. Those portions are again subdivided into holdings of stocks within the family. The mother divided, divides her land among her daughters, usually on their marriage, reserving a large, larger share for Kakuddu. 
the older daughters hold their shares as property entirely separated from those of the rest of the family without any control by kakhuddu each can sell their portion uh, with reference to kakhuddu actually i should mention that kan kakhuddu was the youngest daughter he used to inherit the property in the khasi within the khasi community the above analysis provides an an idea how, about how the legal formation in northeast india during the colonial period had been shaped by various disruptive forces division of property being the most significant amidst those conquest and culturalize culturalization of the space thus to work together to decide the socio socio cultural life of the ethnic communities in the region it is time to conclude a rather lengthy narrative my study has explored the historical roots of what is currently called northeast problem through the windows of law it is analyzed how the colonial law and its continuity in the post colonial period forged an inexorable link between the current legal structure and continuous continuous ethnopolitical turmoil hindering economic and diplomatic growth despite different policy policy measures over a period of time northeast india constitutes as one of the most important portfolios of the indian state despite its richness in natural and human resources this region still poses pressing challenges to the indian state ever since in the independence the northeast problem has so far been dealt within the development and the development paradigm law hardly drew the attention of the researchers and policy makers as one of the most uh, as one of the major sources of conflict and reasons for an eth- estranged ethno state relationship in 1995 bk raimbarwon the eminent anthropologist and ideologue in policy research on the tribal communities pointed out that i quote starting point of the authentic democracy and quote for the post colonial state should be i quote outright rejection of austenian legal epistemology which informs the judiciary and land resource based policy planning and quote the emphasis on economic policy had been initiated by jawaharlal nehru with the assumption that development programs would act as a panacea that would resolve the problems in the in this region the term development was used interchangeably with growth the policy structures with the development under development paradigm persist still date without yielding optimum result the entire region still remains within a twilight zone of hope and dystopia the need to refurbish legal structure is still treated as secondary while the indian state seeks to integrate northeast india within the global economy through diplomatic commercial and economic links with south and southeast asia through formerly lookist and now actist policy it is time to cast a gaze beyond backwardness development horizon the present study is a modest attempt to look at law as one of the major historical roots of northeast problem and draw the attention of the concerned authorities about the imperatives to have a fresh look at current legal structure sorry to meet the changing economic social <coughs> sorry and political needs of the people and also to boost the dynamic forces towards overall growth 
of the region in terms of human development index economic commercial prosperity and diplomatic linkage thank you uh, <coughs> thank you madam uh, for your very very interesting presentation i hope we all enjoy the the presentation so in this uh, the presentation has uh, given an in-depth analysis of the history and the the politics of legal formation in the northeast of india and she has also very rightly analyzes how the law in the region was essentially a product of colonial imperatives to establish hegemony over people and resources